Welcome to Agronomy Moment. I'm your host, Wendell Cohen. We bring in people who agree with me, disagree with me, and above all, are not afraid to say it like it is. Our goal here is to challenge what we think, understand the why behind agronomical advice, and most of all, eliminate the noise in the room that are distractions so we can focus on the information that is relevant to your situation. A moment called now. All living things need the here and now. Crops won't grow with rain next month, sunshine this fall, or the right nutrient applied next year. Decisions to protect the life of living things require us as parents, leaders, and farmers to make decisions for the moment and in the moment. This makes farming fast-paced with limited information to act upon. This podcast is about farmers making decisions in the moment for end results that last not only a month, a season, or year, but a lifetime, ultimately even your children's future. Your crop needs a decision in the moment. Your farm needs a decision in the moment. And that's where we come in. Come for the agronomy and stay for the fun. Let's make decisions that increase your potential. Welcome back everybody here to Agronomy Moment. Um, I'm really excited today because for quite a few months, Selena and I have been talking about pH and base saturation as it relates to some uh, input and feedback. And by the way, if you have informa- have topics you want us to research, to look into, uh, Bex has tremendous resources and a lot of what we have co- relates to Bex PFR, the practical farm research, agronomy resources like Crop Talk, and, and the wide range of agronomists across Bex marketing territory. And so today, you don't have to listen to Wendell or I. <laughs> that's right. You don't have to listen to us all the time. And for sure, not me. But today we were, I, we were thinking about this pH topic. And the more we studied it over Christmas holidays, at least for myself, the, the more and more in the weeds I became until finally I realized other than spending years and years of trying to slowly absorb some of this, maybe we could have a faster solution. And that was to call John Skinner. <laughs> And he is a, a regional agronomy manager for Bex Hybrids in the Illinois area. John, welcome here to this podcast. Can you tell us, is Illinois your only region? Hey, hey, Wendell. Hey, Selena. Uh, thanks for having me. Wendell, I cover Illinois and I cover Iowa. So I work with the agronomy teams in both those states uh, okay. for the time being. Gotcha. Okay. I stand correct on that. Illinois and Iowa. So welcome here today. Today we're going to talk about pH and base saturation, and I feel like we have um, have some interesting topic, uh, interesting points on this coming up. And so, without further ado, we're going to dive right into this. First of all, John, talk to us a little bit about brief, uh, just kind of be really technical for a moment and talk about pH. What is it? Yeah, so pH is a measure of the hydrogen atoms in the soil. And so we look at soils that have uh, acidic pHs that are going to be those that trend below seven. Uh, well, seven is is a basic soil, so that's that's the baseline for you. Anything trending below that tends to be on the acidic side. And uh, when we get above that, we're talking about alkali soils or alkalinity that that uh, okay. will affect your crop nutrient there. So pH is a measure of of hydrogen atoms and what they do within the soil. Perfect. Next, let's talk about the, what it, how it affects us. So what are these hydrogen atoms and how they affect nutrient availability? Let's talk about corn a bit and soybeans and the effect on them. Yeah, so when we look at pH, one of the, one of the factors in most of the areas that I deal with is going to come into play when we get into those acidic pHs. So when we drop our pH um, down, when we start getting below 6, into those mid-5s, that's when we start talking about our macronutrients have an availability availability issues. So you're going to talk about things like uh, potassium and phosphorus being the two main drivers there. Uh, but then as you slide even farther, if you get down below five five into the into the real acidic range, into the into the blueberry range, I like to call it. Yep. Then we start yep. talking about a, a lot of tie up of micronutrients and an extreme tie up of our macronutrients. So pH is a key driver in nutrient availability. Now, on the high side of things, if you get if you blow past seven and get into the mid sevens, 
uh, we start talking about uh, iron deficiency. Uh, we do see some of those other macronutrients become deficient at that time too. And uh, so we run into some issues with that as well. So that sweet yep. spot is going to be somewhere in that, in that six, two to six, eight range for our corn and soybean production. Okay. So tell me a little bit, if you would uh, differentiate between corn and soybeans just a bit, what might be more sensitive to correct pH, if you will? So, so my opinion, Wendell, is going to be that soybeans are a crop, uh, when we get into an adverse pH range, that we see take it a little harder. They tend to have more right. yield reductions when we get out of our comfortable range of pH. One big thing you look at on the on the high pH side, so when you get into higher pH on soybeans, and that, that typically happens as you move north into some of those northern Iowa, Minnesota, Dakota-type climates, you'll start okay. seeing uh, iron deficiency chlorosis in soybeans, stunning of yep. the plant, yellowing of the plant. Sometimes in severe situations, you'll see death of the plant uh, as they're in the seedling stage. So that becomes a big concern with a high pH. When we get into more acidic pHs, we start talking about still, again, we will see some stunting of the plant height. We will see some issues with soybean nodulation. So those those soybeans like to live uh, in that comfortable pH range, you know, in that 6.3, 6.4, up to yeah. 6.8 range. And that's when nodulation of the soybean uh, with those bacteria is most efficient. So we drop below that, we start seeing some nodulation issues. Also, we start seeing availability of potassium become an issue. At that point, uh, potassium is a, a key driver in plant growth and development. So we'll see, we'll see shorter plants, we'll see stunted plants, and we'll see plants with less nodules. At the okay. end of the day, what that's going to do is, so th the name of the game in soybean yield is you got to have plants per acre, you got to have yep. nodes per plant, you got to have pods per nodes, seeds per pods, and then seed size. So yep. if you reduce one of those factors, specifically in this, when, when dealing with pH, we see a stunted plant, a shorter yep. plant, we're going to reduce the number of nodes on that plant, which is going to offset or decline every single other factor that came beyond that. So when gotcha. we reduce the number of the nodes, we potentially have less nodulation to fix nitrogen for that plant we see a reduction in yield that, and as temperamental as soybeans are sometimes, once you once you hit that point, it's hard to overcome it. Whereas on yeah. corn, it can naturally handle a more acidic pH, but at the same time, it, if we have a reduction in ear length, we got hybrids now that can make that up in kernel flex or kernel depth. And so oh. we tend to see easier management or my opinion is that it's easier to manage corn in yep. a adverse ph environment than it is to manage soybeans very interesting i want to change it just a little bit here to talking about drought dry soils the decline of ph and we're talking climate here more in a broad spectrum how does this affect ph or does it even is it even worth a, a mention Yes. So the quick and dirty answer to how drought slows the decline of pH all has to do with water. Typically, okay. when we see water introduced to a soil environment, that's when we start to see those chemical reactions happen and you see uh, the reduction of pH over time. That's why we have that's why we've been the standard recommendation of, you know, lime in every four years is because yeah. that's how long it's taken for that water to interact and break down the actual lime particles that we put out there and, okay. and be effective in the soil. The other thing that comes to mind is if you track the collection of rainwater, lots of universities, lots of, lots of folks have tracked acidity of rainwater over time. Okay. And so since the introduction of the Clean Air Act and lower amounts of sulfur in the at, from atmospheric deposition, meaning essentially acid rain. If we look back 20, 25 years ago, the typical pH of our rainwater was in that mid five range. So fairly acidic. Yes. When we look at it now, we're in the low to mid sixes on rainfall pH. Okay. 
So you're not introducing an acidic solution to your soil, which would cause a decline in soil pH. But if you think about it, an inch of water over an acre is going to be roughly around 27,000 gallons of water. So as we have that 27,000 gallons of water, now with a, with a higher or more basic pH, you're not going to have the effect on the soil you had. So that's a little data to back up. When you don't have water present, period, you typically don't see that, that soil uh, have a change in pH. Now, I will say, if we get in more arid regions where irrigation is present and we look at a high level of evaporation from the soil, sometimes, depending on the water source, source you will have an accumulation of salts there. That can drive a pH uh, in the wrong direction if you're not careful there. So drought affects slow okay. the decline of pH, yes, but it all has to do with water and the water source we're looking at. Gotcha. So like in the irrigated situations where there's high salt contents, the pH is going to tend to climb, right? It'll be more alkaline. Am I yes, you're going to tend to climb with those. Uh, that's why in a lot of yep. those, if you think about uh, some soybean varieties that are in that, that, those longer windows, uh, you see yes. some that have excluders and salt excluders in them. Uh, that's a big sure. benefit for those because just through the natural, the, the groundwater source has a level of sodium in it. You apply that to stay ahead of the drought or stay ahead of the heat. You're going to get evaporation. You're going to leave, leave with minimal salt uh, in those soil environments, and, and that could cause a climb in pH. Yeah, I'm glad we brought up the point there on that Clean Air Act, just so we kind of correlated the acid and sulfur to yes. one another, um, just making that correlation. So, I find it very intriguing and interesting because I did not know that the rain had changed, although I do remember, John, you remember when you were young listening to, you know, maybe in school about acid rain and things, and that's not really talked about now, is it? No, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't, think it's something uh, that... We... Yeah, it, it's something that's it's been cleaned up a lot and if you look at the salt of sulfur deposition maps over time you can get it from the usda or or any climate yeah. corporation that that it's it's drastically decreased especially window where you're at where i'm at i still get i get probably 25 percent more sulfur deposition than you do uh just being closer to the east okay. coast and so uh oh, it, yeah. it's yeah. an interesting dynamic there and so that leads into another topic of uh, applied sulfur, but that's for another day. Yes, that is another <laughs> <laughs> we We better not, otherwise we will never get pull out of this <laughs> um, dive. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about, uh, let's change it again to insects, diseases, weeds, and, and the effects of, like, P how does pH affect us, our ability to control some of these pests, if you would, just a little bit. Yeah, I'll give you the quick and dirty on this. I am not I am not a herbicide expert by any means. You have one of those in Missouri there named Alex Long. Yes. If you got to phone a friend, that's your guy to do it. Yes. Um, what I will say, though, is that soil pH will drastically affect your weed bank. So there are certain species of weeds that like, just like crops that like to grow in more acidic conditions, there are certain species that like to grow in more alkali conditions. And you you can find research, you can find information that says, hey, if I got a, a flush of velvet weed that grows out there, or velvet leaf that grows out there, more than likely my pH is going to be in this range. Uh, it also plays heavily into the effect of soil applied residual herbicides. Um, yes. When we see drastic swings in pH, we do see some groups of active ingredients that have less efficacy uh, versus certain weeds. And I think, Wendell, you brought it up. And Selena, you've seen it too uh, over time where you got the same herbicide programs on essentially neighboring farms. One works fantastic. The other one is a total dud. Yep. And uh, yep. those things come into mind that, that pH is a driver in that, especially on those soil applied residual products. Gotcha. And talk a little bit about plant diseases and how pH might, I'm not saying it is direct, but it could be a correlation to disease control. Yeah, we all we all know that potassium availability can be uh, can be tied up a little bit as we move into more acidic pH conditions. 
potassium is a huge driver uh, in amino acid components that are natural plant defense mechanisms. So as we see a reduction in potassium availability, a reduction in potassium within the plant, uh, we have a lot of building blocks, a lot of proteins that rely on potassium to have those natural uh, plant defense mechanisms. And so we could yes. see an increase in foliar leaf diseases in those situations. Gotcha. It, one last thing, I mentioned insects, but I was actually more even thinking a little bit about SCN populations. Does Is there any effect of pH on uh, cyst nematodes? Or? If I would make a correlation, as our pH declines, our nematode index increases. Uh, a lot of times when I see lower pHs, and we have a cyst nematode problem, so those populations rise in lower pHs. Okay, I got you. And now we're talking technically anything below like six or five and a half more. I mean, we're talking fairly acidic. It does get more. Yeah, typically we can, we can do a lot. Uh, we can have a lot of corrective action. We can have a lot of fertility plants when we're talking in that five, seven, and above range. Once we start yeah. dropping below there, we get pretty spicy on some things. I mean, we could get right. we get nematodes that blow through the roof. We get fertility interactions that are less than desirable. And so yep. um, when we get into those ranges, it, things can get a little dicey. Now, I mean, I've been working with the farm recently. A, a, a guy just picked it up. We got soil pHs that are below five and uh, – Oh, wow. It's it's not been managed well in those situations. Fortunate it's a heavier soil, it's a it's a more loamy soil. So we're not having a cyst interaction there, but but our potassium availability, our our fertilizer availability is is very, very poor. Gotcha. Talking about pH and amendments, um, I was curious, do CECs have any factor in, in this here as far as it relates to the capacity? of the cations or what's your thoughts? Absolutely. CEC plays a, a big role uh, in the amount of cations that can be stored in that soil. So if we look at a, a CEC, uh, the number of exchange sites, typically as our CEC it increases, uh, that means we're, we have a higher clay content in the soil. The higher clay content okay. means potential for more exchange sites. So as we increase our CECs, typically uh, we have we have a that soil is a, is a, able to to buffer more clay content. Buffering capacity is a huge thing that we look at, um, and so a lot of times uh, on your notes there we got buffer pH listed. A lot of times those tighter okay. clay-based soils are more resistant to change from a liming application um, than those that have a lower CEC um, present in them, which would be yeah. a larger larger pore size, more sandier-based soil for simplicity. Got it. So we need to remember that as we amend our soils or try to amend them to understand what our capacity of our soil is and its clay content. Yeah, yeah, and and so Let, if you look at your soil test, uh, typically on a soil test you'll see a pH row. It's on the far right. Uh, then you'll see a buffer pH in there. So a buffer yep. pH will. I'm gonna say. I'm not gonna say always, but a buffer pH is typically yeah. slightly higher than what your pH reading is on there. And what you look at on yep. that. Yep. It's a great indicator of how how resistant your soil is to change. So if I'm looking at a soil that's got a pH reading of 6.0 and a buffer pH of 6.8, that soil is going to be very receptive to change, meaning if I apply a ton of lime, I'm going to see yep. a great improvement in my soil pH. Now, if that same soil yep. had that 6.0 pH had a buffer pH, of 6.2, that means that soil is going to be more resistant to change from liming materials uh, than the one with the buffer pH of 6.8. So that's a quick and easy way uh, to look at it and be like, all right, even though 
I want to take my my, my pH to six point four, six point five. I got a six point two buffer pH. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna need increased tonnage there of liming material to get me to where I want to be versus the next soil type over that uh, maybe a six pH and a six point eight buffer pH. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So you're that range or that difference between the two is what defines how easy it is to amend or how much material. That's right. Thank you everybody for joining us on this uh, podcast for pH. And we are going to continue this conversation down the road where John Skinner continues to talk about other parts of the soil dynamic. The next one up will be on base saturation and what that is, how we look at it. And then we will have a third podcast with John Skinner in which he will bring all of these two together into a summary in helping us name what our number one priority is as we look at soil samples in our farms and what he likes to focus on to make sure those things are right. Those are our number one things to make sure are right. It's a, a good summary. So this is number one of three and we'll be back soon. See ya. If you want alerts on what we are finding in the field, go to Top Ag Services dot com forward slash signups to receive alert or subscribe to our youtube channel it is our goal to bring you the most recent and advanced information possible if you have any questions or feedback feel free to reach out to us anytime we also ask you that you give us a like and follow our channel wherever you listen to your podcasts or watch these videos this ultimately helps us reach more people like you Hey, this has been Wendell Cohen, your show host. Thank you to all who made this show possible. This show is over. See ya.